Hey everybody, it's the uh, Crypto Anarchist here and I'm bringing you guys another video on uh, Bitcoin and specifically in this video we're going to be talking about Bitcoin as it relates to intellectual property. And I'm going to kind of aim this video at uh, Stefan Kinsella. I don't know if he'll see this video. I know he had a, um, a, uh, a debate with Craig Wright. It was probably one of the worst debates I've ever seen. Um, it it just wasn't the greatest debate. I have a lot of respect for Stefan Kinsella, but <clears throat> sorry, I have a lot of respect for Stefan Kinsella, but him and Craig Wright were not getting anywhere in the debate. I'm not saying like they're both stupid. That's why the debate was bad. I'm saying the debate didn't it didn't progress anywhere, so it was a complete waste of time. Um, but I just kind of wanted to uh, argue the case sort of for intellectual property while still saying that my argument still aligns with the arguments of Stefan Kinsella, or at least I'm pretty sure that it does. Um, so I know this is going to sound really weird because Stefan Kinsella argues against intellectual property. His, uh, his uh, What you could call, I guess, his masterpiece is his uh, essay you know, against intellectual property. That's what he's known for, is arguing against intellectual property. He's also really big amongst, uh, you know, in the libertarian legal theory. Um, he's really well-versed in uh, estoppel, which is kind of the foundation of libertarian legal theory. But anyways... Um, I think he's a little bit wrong on intellectual property, although I'd have to completely reread the essay to know for sure. And, um, you know, I make too many videos and I got too much going on outside of this YouTube channel to, you know, reread abs absolutely everything uh, on all the videos and topics I cover. But I just wanted to explain why I think some libertarians take Kinsella's viewpoint too far. And they actually justify, or they start justifying fraud within the realm of the distribution of digital goods, okay? And so, before we get to that, I need to do a real quick crash course for the uh, Kinsella libertarians about Bitcoin and hash tables, and how hash tables work, and how they're organized in order to, um, in order to store data in... Uh, in these uh, databases but without revealing what that data is and so that has a lot of very interesting implications um, as far as um, intellectual property goes and again I hate this term intellectual property and I'm gonna keep using it and because and I hate the term intellectual property because it's very vague and it can refer to a lot of different things at different times so I'm, I'm gonna apologize for that and for the fact that I don't have a better word for it but you guys understand what I'm talking about when I say intellectual property and I'm just gonna say there are certain forms of intellectual property that seem to be legitimate and just because of the nature of how Bitcoin functions when you look at Bitcoin under the hood uh, Bitcoin almost like proves it um, and so what we're gonna look at here this picture right here it's just it's a hash table and so all a hash table is um, it looks like a bracket, like a tournament bracket. I don't know if you guys have ever, you know, like uh, March Madness, you guys ever fill out those brackets for March Madness. This is just like a bracket like this. So for this uh, hash table, we are, we're going to hash four separate things. So it's just like a tournament for four people. It's a single elimination tournament style. And that's the way hash tables look. Um, and the reason why this is important is because uh, for two reasons. One... Uh, the reason why Bitcoin's so interesting is because you can put any sort of information you want to into these hash tables. And if you look at each one of these hashes that we have here, and the hashes are the things that are actually in the brackets, okay? So the hash is just, a, it's a random uh, bunch of numbers and letters, right? And so it's just this real random looking long string of numbers and letters. And it's it's 32 characters, I believe, um, because uh, this is the SHA-256 hash, but so each one of those uh, hashes in those brackets, it's all 32 characters long, okay? So no matter what you put into the hash, you're going to come out with something 32 characters long. And so why this is important is, let's say Stefan Kinsella, you know, he wanted to distribute his books, right? He wanted to distribute his essay um, against intellectual property, and he wanted to ensure that everyone who... Uh, his book was distributed to 
uh, that they received the legitimate book, right? So one thing that he could do is he could actually hash his book. And so if you look up at the top of this hash table, this fir the first hash that I do, it's actually the first sentence of his essay. Um, and you can get, you guys, if you want to, you can look up a, uh, a SHA-256 calculator right now. Um, they have these available online, and you can follow along with me here. But this first sentence is just, all libertarians favor property rights, comma, and agree that property rights include rights in tangible resources, period. Okay, and so I don't include the quotes, but if you just uh, take the hash of that text right there, starting with a capital A and ending in the period, the hash that you end up with, it's, um, it starts with 8A7, ends with 80B, okay? And so then, if Stefan Kinsella actually wanted to add every other single one of his books to a hash table, and obviously that is just a hash of the first sentence of his book, but you, he could hash the entire book, it doesn't matter. Uh, you can hash whatever you want. It, you're going to end up with something that's just 32 characters long. But if he hash it, like let's say you take Stefan Kinsella's, like each one of his books, his essays, every one of his articles, and you put them all in a hash table together, um, you just do this process that we showed here, um, or that we're showing right here. So in this hash table, I didn't actually hash all of Stefan Kinsella's uh, work. Uh, I just hashed... Uh, book two, that's literally what I typed out. Again, you guys can follow along with this. It's just capital B uh, O O K space two. And then the, so the hash of book two is nine A F A. That's what it starts with. And it ends with B nine four eight. Then I took the hash of book three. Uh, so that's that third hash down there. And that's, uh, it starts with A zero D ends with FF3, then I took the hash of book 4, and that starts with F97, and and it ends with um, 07E. So if you look at this, the way a hash table is set up is, uh, you know, after you hash everything that you have, so if Stefan Kinsella wants to hash all of his work, um, he's got all these individual hashes, but that's not the only thing that, you know, Bitcoin does. So if for uh, Stefan Kinsella, he not only wants to prove that, you know, one of his works is legitimate, because that's not enough, right? If he only proves that his essay um, against intellectual, like, if, if I'm trying to buy Stefan Kinsella's uh, essay against intellectual property, and he only pro can prove to me the legitimacy of that essay, well, how do I know that, like, this, this Stefan Kinsella is the legitimate Stefan Kinsella? Like, I want to know all his other work is legitimate as well. Like, is this the Stefan Kinsella ha who has written the other books that, you know, Stefan Kinsella is known for? Is, is he the Stefan Kinsella that writes all these articles on Lou Rockwell that I see? Like, I want to have all these things validated for him. Like, I want to know, is this the real deal? Is this the real guy? You know, I want to know, is this, <laughs> is you know, just is this the real Stefan Kinsella? So the thing that hash tables do is that not only do you have the individual hashes for each book or each article or each essay, that you've written, but you hash the hashes of your individual works together, and then you hash those hashes together on your, until you're left with one final hash. And the reason why you do this is because the way a hash function works is that whatever you start with, you'll only like the, you can only have one output. So for one input, there's only one possible output, right? Um, but the, the thing is, is that if you alter any of the inputs whatsoever, then the output, is, the final output is altered, okay? So if there is some sort of imposter trying to say he's Stefan Kinsella and, uh, you know, maybe he's trying to offer advice to somebody and they're paying him for advice or something, uh, if... If Stefan Kinsella just used uh, a, a Bitcoin application and used a, uh, a hash table to uh, just hash all of his life's work onto onto a, onto the Bitcoin uh, blockchain, then he could verify his identity beyond a shadow of a doubt, and no one could ever you know deny it. And that's what that's the crazy thing that Bitcoin does. Okay, and so when I talk about intellectual property as it relates to Bitcoin, and when I'm going to sort of debate Stefan Kinsella here, this is what I'm talking about. I'm talking about intellectual property in your own identity, or it's not exactly reputation, but it's just that there's only one you. Okay, there's a scarce you. Okay, you as a creator are scarce. So like again, if we if we want to talk about buying like uh, music or something, so if I want to buy uh, you know some the newest album by Taylor Swift, 
I want to know, I want to make sure it's actually Taylor Swift's, and there's only, like, Taylor Swift only comes out with so many albums, right? So if I want to pay for Taylor Swift's album, that is a scarce thing, the relationship between Taylor Swift and her albums. Okay, she only produces so many. That's what, like, that's the... That's the part of intellectual property that is valid, okay? So I'm not saying, like, you can own knowledge. I'm not saying anything like that. I'm just saying that you can own, or there's a scarce relationship between a creator and their content, okay? And so they ha they own that, that relationship, and nobody else can try and pretend like they're that creator, okay? And you can see this sort of, uh, you know... Uh, I, like on YouTube, if you guys ever watch streamers or something like that, streamers have a lot of people who just take their content and put it on YouTube. And a lot of times people go to YouTube thinking they're watching a streamer, but they're watching someone who steals their content. They don't know it, okay? And this is a sort of fraud. And it's not like, you know, this falls under libertarian common law. So like the, the actual problem or like the actual... Um, the, the actual... Um, penalty for this fraud, I, I can't tell you the exact penalty for it, okay? I don't know the exact penalty for it, and it sort of depends. So, like, let's say, you know, you buy a DVD, copying that DVD once or twice for yourself, for your family. That doesn't really matter. That's Nobody's really going to say that, like, that should be punishable by fines or imprisonment. It's when you try and, you know, buy a DVD and then you distribute it millions of times because then it's like, okay, if you're the distributor, you seem to have some relationship with the, the creator. And when people are taking, like, when people are watching something from a creator, they kind of expect that creator to be uh, given money in some way or some shape or form, you know what I mean, like, or to be helped out. There, there, there's, a, there's a bit of fraud going on, and I'm not saying, again, I'm not saying, like, Every time you watch a movie for free, that's fraud. I'm not saying anything like that, but I'm just saying that there's a relate, there's a scarce relationship between a creator and their content. Okay, and so that's where the fraud can occur. Now, again, it's up to common law to de determine like what's criminal and what's not, and what really is punishable. What should be punishable by fines, and what's just like you know should be punishable by cease and desist orders that's that's a completely different thing okay that's a completely different thing but the, again if we go back to this example to using hash tables in bitcoin uh the one thing that like if you guys had trouble visualizing this do you guys have uh, like i'll i'll, I'll sh explain this using a runescape example and i know this is sounds really nerdy and stupid but do you guys ever remember fishing in runescape uh, if you were you know if you didn't if you weren't a member if you didn't pay to play the game uh and uh you'd you'd have to go to karamja or whatever to fish lobsters that was the best way to level up if you were a higher level fishing you know player or whatever on runescape and uh, the problem with it was is that after you were done fishing, the, what you really wanted to do, to do was cook your stuff. Um, but if you had if you brought the the axe and the tinderbox, you had you had to give up space in your inventory, so you couldn't f fish as much. Okay, and so that that was the trade-off. And so n nobody ever really wanted to bring an axe and a tinderbox because there was the the sort of uh, the tragedy of the commons in RuneScape, right? So what Bitcoin does, if you go back to these hash tables, is Bitcoin allows in certain ways for you to um, basically turn your, like if you were playing RuneScape, to make it so you could create fires, but so that your fire would only be usable by certain players, okay? And so it allows you to, yes, you can create a fire that you can use for yourself, so it doesn't, like it doesn't inhibit production whatsoever, but it allows you to selectively choose who to you know, who to allow to use your um, your fire. And, I, and the reason why, why I bring up this fire example is because the one thing that people who talk about intellectual property always bring up, and let's go to my slides here now, they always bring up uh, the, the, the idea that fire is non-scarce, okay? And so, again, if we're, if we're talking about intellectual property, specifically as it relates to Bitcoin, I'm not denying that knowledge cannot be owned, okay? I'm never going to deny this. But w the, the issue I have is when uh, people like Kinsella say that intellectual property is non-scarce like fire and it's that you know that's not true if i have a fire in my home i can forbid you from using that fire or if like let's say i i, I let you get near the fire i don't have a problem with you being near the fire and you have some sort of like a magic potion or magic bottle that can hold the fire in the bottle um, it seems very incorrect to me, and I know uh, obviously this isn't this isn't my argument here, but 
if, if I have you over in my house and I have this fire, it seems like I can forbid you from putting that fire in, the, in a magic bottle for you to use later on. It's still my fire, you know what I mean? Um, and you could argue that maybe that has to do with the land rights that the, are implied with the creation of the fire, but that's my whole point here, is that even within something like fire, which is sort of non-scarce, like you can share your fire and it doesn't take away from your fire, you can still, you know, exclude people from using your fire, because it is sort of scarce. Like, when I create a fire, it's still my fire, you know what I mean? Like, um, and, and another way to think about this is, is, like, let's say you live in this frozen wasteland, and it's you and this other person, and you're the only person who ever creates fires. Uh, you're, you know... In, like, the other person needs the fires to survive, but they never help you with the creation of the fire, but they always stand by the fire and use the warmth of it. It's like, I do believe you could exclude this person from the use of your fire. Um, I absolutely do believe that you can. Now, obviously, you have to go through some uh, sort of... Uh, some sort of labor to try and exclude them but again if we go back to the hash tables with bitcoin if we look at this like again because these hashes that come out like whatever whatever you put it through a hash function it comes out as just a random string of 32 characters um it's hexadecimal characters um but anyway since it's just a random string of hexadecimal characters um present so what i mean by this is um Stefan Kinsella could then, like, validate to people his identity, like, if they bought his book, he could validate that that book was legitimate and let them check, like, they could check the hash of that book themselves, they could validate that hash themselves, and then they could check the hash of that individual book against the hashes of all of Stefan Kinsella's other books, and because of the fact that they have um, access to the original source of one of the leafs of the hash table, um, if... Uh, any of the other books that Stefan Kinsella has were altered in any way, um, it changes the final hash. So you actually validate not only the book you're looking at and the book that you have access to, but you validate that book that you're looking at and have access to in relationship to uh, the other hashes that exist on the blockchain. Okay, and so it, the, the reason why this is important is because uh, this actually, like, uh, what Bitcoin does is it really allows people to hide secrets. And again, going back to that old RuneScape example, and I know this is sort of a stupid example, but just because something is sort of within the commons, you know, like so uh, the argument that a lot of intellectual property or whatever you want to call it is uh, it's, it's within like the public commons, so it can't necessarily be owned, that's not necessarily a good thing. So if we go back to that RuneScape example again, nobody within the RuneScape community ever wanted to bring uh, the tinderbox and the axe because it just, again, it took up two, like it took up two spaces in your inventory and so nobody would do it. You had 28 spaces of inventory and nobody would do it. So like when there's the, when there's commons, you know, there's the tragedy of the commons. So the one thing that's great about Bitcoin is it allows you, again, it allows the person who brings, uh, their own axe and their own wood, uh, it allows them to offer their fire for sale and then that creates a market for that fire because again you can't create a market there because once the fire is created in the runescape just the way the game world is created like it, it the fires are public anyone can use it so it, it created a tragedy of the commons and so when people within the uh austrian community say things like yeah a lot of intellectual property it's it's just common property so you can't really own it that's not really a good thing and so what bitcoin does is again it's not it's not taking something that can't be owned and trying to, you know, artificially impose legal property distinction upon it. That's not what we're trying to do with Bitcoin. All we're saying is that with what Bitcoin does is it allows you to verify the authenticity and integrity of some file or document. And the, the integrity of a document as it relates to the creator of that document that is a scarce good, okay? And so that's like every time there's an implicit sort of an agreement. And so Stefan Kinsella really understands estoppel. So I would, I hope he understands my agreement, or not my agreement, but my argument when I say there's an implicit agreement when you use somebody's code that they sort of can vouch for it. You know what I mean? So like let's say uh, you're using bootlegs like Windows software. Who's really responsible for issues in that code? Is it the person who's distributing it? I don't think the distributor is really going to accept responsibility for or it's going to be there's sort of a different 
responsibility level that people who are distributing bootleg software have and so you can say there's a fraud to the customer because when you're buying the software like if I think I'm buying Windows software and I'm getting bootleg software that's a you know it's a different thing and even if like even if I know I'm buying bootleg software um, it's still like if it's completely copied just straight from Windows like let's say just somebody goes to Windows and they have some sort of contract with Windows again because the one thing again if you go back to this hash table the way that Windows will employ people is it won't reveal their entire code to their developer base like they, with zero knowledge proofs and hash tables Windows can selectively reveal parts of their code and then they can like you know just through contracts say hey you know you can't really release the secrets on our code for a certain amount of time whatever because it's it's within your contract that's legal under libertarian theory and I'm pretty sure Stefan Kinsella says it is in, within his book and so that's all that Bitcoin really does and so it just says you know we're gonna keep secrets for a certain period of time or whatever um, but there is a relationship between the owner of a good and its its creator so there's there's a difference between just copying like you know let's say you buy Taylor Swift's album and you know you copy it once just as a backup in case you break it or maybe you copy it once for your mom just so she can have a copy that's not really criminal and illegal but if you copy it a billion times and distribute it a billion times that's kind of illegal because whoever's distributing this file there's sort of an implied relationship with the creator you know what I mean there, it's sort of implied and I don't like again I think this falls under a stop and it's sort of like the uh, um, it's really similar to the labor or the libertarian theory of evictionism as it relates to abortion where uh, the, liber the, the libertarian theory on abortion is that technically speaking you can't force a mother to bring a baby to term but you can't let a mother kill her baby either and so that's the same thing with intellectual property where it's like um, technically speaking a lot like a lot of intellectual property is not valid so like you know you can't stop someone from copying your um, your work and you can't stop them from altering it so like Taylor Swift can't stop someone from taking her song and doing a remix of it like that's fine however if someone does a remix of it they can't pretend like it's their original you know what I mean they have to at least give some sort of you know like it, it doesn't even have to be well I, I don't I don't even want to say they have to give something to the original creator but it's a sort of fraud like let's say if so, you know if Taylor Swift creates a new song but she never releases it to the public and then Katy Perry takes it and she literally copies it word for word and even uses Taylor Swift's voice in the recording and says it's her own video you know what I mean uh, so there, there's just there's a relationship between the creator of a uh, some sort of digital good and its creator that's that's all I'm trying to say and that relationship is scarce and so that relationship can create fraud with the customer base um, but that fraud is relative but again it, because that fraud is relative the, the the problem becomes like if you start distributing millions or billions upon files that you know that sort of imply that you have some sort of relationship with the creator uh, even though like the copying and distributing of one file is not much of a crime doing it millions of or billions of times is a completely different thing so I think libertarians take it too far so I just wanted to bring this up and I just wanted to say like you know I, I, I want to see if Stefan Kinsella understands hash tables and how they verify the integrity of data uh, just so that people can say, hey, this this is the real Microsoft Windows software, you know what I mean? And so obviously someone could steal Microsoft software, and if it's the exact same file, it'll, ha it'll come up the exact same way in the blockchain, but because that person is not the original creator, um, you know, I, I feel like this is fraud, especially considering that all that they have to do to change that file to show that they're not the original creator would be to, like, change one bit one bit and that's anything like so if you you know if you change uh, one of the characters in any of the hashes that I had in my previous example if we go back and look at this if we if you change any one of these hashes and again all these hashes uh, in case I didn't explain this the best for the people before you just hash the hashes together so in the first bit like the first hash on uh, the the hashes that are on the leftmost side and again the hashes are within the brackets the hashes on the leftmost side are just SHA-256 hashes of what is contained within the quotation so the first hash is 
you know, that sentence up above, the second hash is just book two, the third hash is book three, the fourth hash is book four. Um, the, the two hashes that are in the center, the one that starts with 03E and then the second one that starts with 51D, uh, those two hashes were created by simply um, putting the first hash and the second hash together, and by that I mean I literally just copy the first hash and then copy, which is just everything contained in the brackets, and then I copy the second hash, which is just everything contained in the brackets, and I just put them together. Okay, so it's literally starts with 8A7, uh, and then it you go through the full first hash, and then the second hash starts at 9AF and then we end at 948 okay and so you would put that together and you hash that and you get 03e and you end with 712e for that hash so again uh, if we look at those two middle hashes that first hash is just the combination of the top two hashes on the left side uh, the second hash in the middle is the combination of the bottom two hashes on the left side or it's the hash of the combination of the bottom two hashes on the left side and then the hash uh, all the way furthest on the right that one that starts with 593 and ends with a78e um, that's just the combination of the two middle hashes or it's a hash of the combination of the two middle hashes and again if you alter anything whatsoever in this chain of events that final hash is altered okay and so all I'm saying is that because it's so easy to alter a final hash like if you put something in a Bitcoin blockchain and you say this and you're just trying to say hey this is mine if someone else tries to distribute that with that hash and, and tries to distribute it like they're you, uh, because they can just change that hash by simply changing any sort of bit whatsoever, any sort of character uh, in any one of the books before, um, and because they can do it so simply, uh, I think that constitutes fraud because it's so simple to uh, distinguish who is who uh, as well as far as the original creator or distributor. Um, so I think this falls under the same sort of rule that the abortion or the evictionist debate does for libertarianism where uh, the libertarian position on abortion, again, is that you cannot force a mother to take a child to term, but if she can easily remove the child with without you know harming it you know she can't just kill it just because she can and so the argument is sort of reversed in the case for Bitcoin where it's like okay so what Bitcoin allows you to do is it allows you to very easily and simply verify the integrity of uh, a huge amount of data uh, in a very short amount of time so again you could have all of Stefan Kinsella's work uh, contained within a few thousand hashes and it would be, you know, a, all contained in one Mer final Merkel root hash is what you call that hash on the right which is a contains all the hashes combined together that's called the root hash so you could have a, a root hash that contains, you know, all the hashes of all the work that Stefan Kinsella has ever done and all you would have to do is change one, you know, put one space in one article uh, of one of Stefan Kinsella's articles and that would change the final root hash and so the whole point here for Bitcoin is that since you can so easily change the final hash that's involved in the storage of a root hash um, this is and since a root hash is used to verify the integrity uh, of a creator in relationship to the the, the work that they have themselves created uh, if you try and distribute a digital document and you try and sign it using the original hash of the original creator and you don't you know just um, alter that hash in some way uh, that's fraud just because it's so simple to alter that hash in some way and you're sort of lying to the people you're distributing to make it seem making it seem like you're the creator okay so this is the argument that I make for Bitcoin as it relates to intellectual property um, I hope this gets out to Stefan Kinsella I know I said uh, you know for those of my audience that actually make it to the end of my videos, because I know a lot of people will watch this video, not that many will get to the end of the video. Uh, the only people who will are the hardcore fans, fans um, and the subscribers. But uh, for those who made it to the end of this video, I don't mind you guys um, whatsoever distributing my videos. It's just, you know, don't o ever overwhelm somebody. That's what I've been trying to say. So, like, for this video, if you can get this to Stefan Kinsella, and I'm not saying, like, send the whole video, because it's a long video, because it's a complicated topic. Nobody else talks about it other than me. But if you can get this video to Stefan Kinsella, or if you understand the idea well enough that you can, you know, summarize the idea to, to Stefan Kinsella, I would love to see his idea on this. Because, again, the whole thing that Bitcoin does with intellectual property is that it doesn't, like, it doesn't allow the owner of knowledge it allows you to own 
uh, the integrity of the, th the knowledge that you have created, or not knowledge that you've created, because obviously, again, knowledge can't be owned, but it allows you to own the integrity of any sort of uh, um, anything that you've created. So anything that can re be represented digitally, as long as you want to prove that, hey, this is mine, you know, if you're trying to distribute it and you're trying to, um, you know, prove that, like for Stefan Kinsella, if he's trying to prove that this is his work, okay, because people put value in his work because it's his work. If he's trying to prove the integrity of his work, he can do it through a hash table, okay? Um, and if someone tries to copy his hash table, they can copy that hash table, but to me that is fraud. And that is the intellectual property that I think that Bitcoin proves is legitimate, is just that you cannot commit fraud, you cannot try and say that you are something that you're not, okay? And so you could not uh, fake this hash table, you could not fake, you know, basically the identity of somebody else, even though you could, you know, just alter his work and then you could say, hey, this is my alterations of Stefan Kinsella's work. And then it, if you showed the hash table of your alterations of Stefan Kinsella's work, again, this would alter the final root hash, so that's not fraud. What I'm saying is that if you try and distribute things, though, like you're the creator when you're not, that to me is fraud. Okay, not theft, th fraud. But um, I hope uh, this helped explain things to people um, in my position. I know it's nuanced, and I know these videos get a little bit long, but um, it, there's, it's kind of unavoidable, guys. I'm sorry there's not that many people who talk about this. Uh, I'll actually include what my uh, donation address in this video. I've been working kind of hard on these videos just because it's a lot of separate topics that are all very... Um, very intricate, very delicate, I guess is what I would say. Um, they're not; these are not easy topics. But again, uh, if you guys enjoy these topics, if you enjoy getting into these deep discussions, then send me a donation. I always enjoy that. And I don't actually like; I'll have to check it, but I don't think I've ever in my life. I don't think I've ever received a Z coin uh, donation. And the price of Z coin, like, it's tanked really hard. And so for me, that's always the time that I want to get involved. And especially with Z coin, it's like you know, one dollar. Or, you know, if you if you want to personally buy one whole Z coin, which would be a lot of its total supply, it, it doesn't cost much right now, you know what I mean? And then if you want to send a donation of like $1 to me, it doesn't cost much, but that's quite a bit of Z coin, you know what I mean? Uh, and so I always enjoy getting donations when the, you know, when the price is low because the quantity of the donation that I receive is high. So I like that. But uh, anyways, uh, I hope you enjoyed this video. There will be more coming out soon.